Well, before we get into it, I, I am going to say tonight we are going to be looking at false prophets. But before we get there, we need to look at what it means to have hope in a biblical perspective of hope, Christian hope in a dark world. So we're going to read a text together, Romans 8, starting at verse 18. Now, I got to give you a little bit of context here. What was Paul talking about when he got onto this subject of creation and nature and so on? Well, he has been wrestling with all the way through Romans, the all the ramifications of the gospel, what it means, how you and I need to be justified because we are by default sinners. We are rebellious against God. God is our righteous judge. We are deemed guilty. He can declare us righteous because of what Jesus Christ did for us. Jesus enters the courtroom, takes our place, takes the guilty verdict, pays the penalty, and we can, our, our case is dismissed. We can leave God's courtroom free of charge. That's wonderful, but Paul doesn't stop there. And he moves into the struggle that we face as justified Christians, as justified people. We're justified in front of God, but we may not feel it all the time. And we still fall to temptations and we feel the strength of temptations. And every day we're faced with the power of sin around us. What is going on? And, and so it's not all celebration right now, is it? We have joy, we have happiness and so on, but Paul gets into this idea, there's a tension going on. And the tension really is between the fact that we still live in these broken physical frames called the physical, the human body. And it's still broken because we still live in a broken world. It's still faulty and it defaults towards selfishness. That's what the New Testament calls the flesh. But inside this human frame, there's a new nature. It's a nature that is guided by the Holy Spirit. So Paul is really wrestling with this idea of when I want to do good things, I don't. And when I don't want to do bad things, I end up doing them. Oh, wretched man that I am, who, who will deliver me from this body of death? And then he goes into this wonderful theme in Romans 8, one of my favorite chapters in all of the Bible because it's a victory chapter. And he goes into the theme of we are guided by the Holy Spirit. He's in us. He's guiding us. He's teaching us. He's moving us. And he has secured a bright future for us. And so in the, in the, in the process of explaining and working all of this out, he gets into a parallel of not just us. We're not the only ones feeling this tension, but the entire creation is feeling this tension between what's happened right now and even with Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, there's a victory. There's a sense of victory. But the whole world is still in this bondage, just like we are in these physical bodies. And what we're looking forward to in a bright future, the entire world is looking forward to as well. So, verse 18, Paul says, For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us, believers, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation has subjected, was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Notice it was subjected in hope by God is the implication that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption. That's a future thing. It's still coming. But the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. The same freedom we're going to obtain, nature is going to obtain. It's a beautiful thing. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our, here it is, our physical bodies. For in this hope, we were saved. Now, hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. This is just a few things that I want to note about hope right before we get into any of this environmental stuff tonight. 
And the first thing is the fact that our broken world is filled with a sense of doom. And we're going to see that tonight. We're going to see a lot of reflections of that in our world. The entire world seems to be filled with this sense of gloominess. And the world is going to end. And there's no hope. And of course, that's exactly what, if you remember, Friedrich Nietzsche actually talked about, didn't he? Friedrich Nietzsche basically said, since we have philosophically done away with God, we don't need God anymore philosophically, there's really no hope left for us. And the 20th century, he he prophesied, really, it would be the bloodiest century yet because, well, we've erased God. Our world is broken. I don't know if you've seen this. Have you seen the doomsday clock? This, uh, the clock was started in 1947 by the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. It was made more from the fear of made man, man-made pardon me, atomic disasters that could end the world, even the Cold War and so on. Uh, this metaphorical clock has changed its focus from atomic fears to, well, we've, we've run out of that, okay, so the Cold War is over. Yes, it's still there. It's kind of in the background. We have Iran, we have North Korea, and so on, but we've changed these fears really to climate change, and what you see in the picture is where the clock is set now. This is the closest it's ever been to midnight. That is the end of the world. This is the closest it's ever been, 100 seconds to midnight all because of climate change. This is our way of trying to amp up the fear and the gloom in people. It's the closest we've ever been to the end of the world. And as Christians, we say, hallelujah. Hope it's true, right? It sits as a symbol of the culture's doomsday prophets. There it is. Our broken world is filled with a sense of doom. And our neighbors are hearing this. It's in the media. It's given to us from our politicians. It's everywhere, right? Secondly, uh, here we go. Christian hope is more than wishful thinking. We need to remember this. When we talk about hope in a Christian or a gospel sense, when we talk about hope that is secured in Jesus, we look at what Paul says about it, okay? When he talks about hope, he's speaking of what is not seen yet, but what is coming, It's guaranteed. It's an anticipatory hope, right? It's anticipated. What does he say about it? Well, in verse 24, in this this hope we were saved. Now, hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? I don't hope for what I see. I see it. I don't have to hope for it. I don't have to anticipate it anymore. It's here. But if we hope for what we do not see, look what he says. He says, we wait for it with patience. Not on edge, like a wonder if it's going to happen. We're not just, this this is not just blind faith, wishful thinking. Man, I hope this really comes out, that works out the way we think it's going to. No, Christian hope is secured in the past. Historically, it's locked in the death and resurrection of Christ. That happened. You can't unhappen that. It happened. It's anchored in that. It's not wishful thinking. It's confident expectation. That's Christian hope. Third, Christian hope is distinct from false hope. Again, because it's founded on the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ, we look forward to a physical resurrection of our bodies. And we look forward to a physical restoration of all of nature in the new heaven and the new earth. Paul kind of... uh, elaborated on this in 1 Corinthians 15, where he talked more about the physical resurrection of our bodies and so on. He said, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits, that's what he called him, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So just like farmers, you know, go to their field, it's coming around harvest time, they're checking every day, when is the harvest going to happen? At some point, they go out in that field and they see that there's fruit. There's some kind of, it, it's, it's producing Those are the first fruits. And what is it? It's a guarantee. It's an absolute guarantee of what's about to happen, what's coming. Jesus is the guarantee, right? He's the guarantee of the resurrection of the dead. And not only that, he's the guarantee, obviously, of the physical resurrection or restoration of the entire world. And that leads to the last point. Christian hope is environmental hope. Or we could say Christian hope includes environmental hope. It doesn't encompass it, but it includes it. 
Romans 8, 22 again, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And I've been witness to childbirth four times and it looks painful, but it's also very hopeful, isn't it? Because there's, there's a good outcome. I, re- I remember before our first child was born and we went to the classes to kind of prepare ourselves for what's coming. And I remember them, the, the people instructing us were, were making that claim. We're saying it's going, to, it's going to be hard and difficult, but the outcome is worth it. The outcome is worth it. That's true in Christian life. It's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. This is what Paul is trying to say in Romans 8, but the outcome is worth it. And even the whole creation right now is groaning in those pains of childbirth, but the outcome is worth it. What is the outcome? Well, Matthew 24, Jesus told us that before the end of the the world, he said, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of the birth pains. He used the very same birth uh, language, metaphor. Revelation 21, verse 1, listen to these words, for I saw a new heaven and a new earth. By the way, that's basically saying a new universe, a new material universe. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. What's the meaning of this heavenly city coming down to the new earth? What, What is the meaning of this? Well, he tells us. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. That's why the heavenly city is coming down to the new earth. That's wonderful. God is going to dwell with his creation. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things are passed away. That's what we have to look forward to. We're going to look at that a little more in a little bit, but I just want to make a quick note right now that every time as Christians we celebrate communion, we are really tying the dimensions of time all together, past, present, future. In the present, we celebrate communion. And what are we saying? In the present, Paul tells us we are declaring, we are declaring that Christ was crucified. Uh, I got to look it up because I'm going to mess this up really Uh, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the, that's it. You, You show the Lord's death in the past until he come in the future. So what are we doing? We're celebrating in communion all dimensions of time. We're saying because of what God has done in the past, we're looking forward, we're declaring this is going to happen in the future. It's absolutely sure. It's as good as done. That's Christian hope. So let's keep that in mind as we move forward into our subject tonight of the false prophets of environmentalism. Now, I want to just mention something immediately about these uh, prophets. Why are we calling them prophets? We're going to notice a lot of similarities to prophets tonight uh, with these guys. And first of all, I want to notice that biblical prophets were always just a little bit on the edge. They were, they were edgy people. In fact, their whole ministry was based around shock value. And, and we've looked at Elijah on Mount Carmel, right? Shock value. And you see how he was like taunting and teasing the prophets of Baal and Asherah, 850 of them. And the things he was saying to them were a little bit edgy and uh, mocking them. And, and then... Uh, then when he builds his altar and fire comes down, would you call that shock value? I'd call that shock value, right? But there were other prophets near the end of Israel's run uh, it, before the exile, guys like Jeremiah, who were really known for shock value. And of course, the Lord called them and told them to do these things, but it takes a certain type of individual uh, to, to actually step out and do these things. At one point, I mean, he, 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 
Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Hosea, they all did some strange things. Jeremiah was told to buy a linen loincloth to wear it for a while and then to take it off, to bury it, and then come back a little while later and dig it up again. You know, what on earth is the point of that? He went to visit a potter at one point to watch him work and then eventually smashed a clay jar in front of all these people and made a big scene out of that. He made a yoke uh, like the, the cattle used to wear, you know, across the neck and with the straps. And he wore this thing with straps on his hands and he just walked around with this thing uh, for a while, just trying to tell the people, this is what's about to happen to you. And at one point, uh, Hananiah, a false prophet, a rival prophet came along, took the yoke off of him, broke it and said, thus says the Lord, God has broken the yoke of Babylon and so on. And God comes back and says, yeah, go tell Hananiah that actually since he's broken that yoke, I just made a yoke of iron. And for anyone who comes under Babylon's captivity is coming under a yoke of iron and so on. So Jeremiah was constantly in, involved in these kinds of activities. Ezekiel, it was the same thing. At one point, he made a miniature model of Jerusalem and he set up all these armies. It was kind of like playing with G.I. Joe. I don't know what they play with anymore. Action figures of some kind, right? And he had this whole war zone all set up for people to see. Uh, he lay on his left side for 390 days and then he lay on his right side for 40 days. You say, what did he have to eat? Well, he was told to bake his food on human feces. Sorry, it's in the Bible. It says that. And uh, when he backed off of that and said, Lord, that's too far. I can't do that. I don't want to defile myself. God changed it to cow feces instead. And that's how he baked his bread for a while. You say, that's crazy. Yeah, that's what he did. And of course, what was it to do? It was to get the attention of the people, the culture. It's about to end Everything is coming crashing down very soon. At one point, he cut off all his hair with his sword and some of his hair he burned and some he threw into the wind and some he was like cutting at with his sword and so on. And uh, he, was, he was trying to, again, say what was gonna happen to the people. Isaiah was told to walk around naked and barefoot for three years. Not exactly a good ministry model. But that's the way it was. Hosea married a prostitute, had children with her, and then continued to pursue her when she was unfaithful to him. Over and over again. Now, we're going to see some similarities to that, but I want to, first of all, just note the biblical criteria for a false prophet. Now, the real prophets themselves were eccentric guys. They did some things that caught people's attention. It was the point. Today we have the Bible. They didn't have that back then. In fact, what we have now are the words of the prophets in writing for us in Scripture. How would you know if one of these guys, like Hananiah, breaking the yoke of uh, Jeremiah and saying, God has done this and so on, how would you know if he's telling the truth or not? You look at Jeremiah, you look at Hananiah and say, I'm not sure which one's telling the truth. How will we know? Well, Moses warned the people as they were going into the promised land of how they would know. A couple things. The first one was, if a prophet or a dreamer in Deuteronomy 13 uh, of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder that he tells you comes to pass, and if he says, let us go after other gods which you have not known and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. So the prophet must lead the people to the one true God, or he's not a prophet. He's not speaking truth. He is not to be relied on. So trust the science. Well, we're going to look at why that might not be a great idea tonight. But as believers, we trust the word of God above everything else. And if someone, it doesn't matter what profession they're from, is seeking to lead us away from trusting God in his word, then we are not to follow or listen to the words of that prophet. We're not to listen to their dreams or to what they're saying with all their credentials. Secondly, Deuteronomy 18. Here's another one. Whoever will not listen to my words that uh, he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. 
That's what happened to false prophets back then. And if, verse 21, you say in your heart, how may we know the word that the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. Well, that pretty much takes out many TV evangelists today. I mean, if you are not 100% successful in your prophecy, you're not a prophet. And again, if they're steering us away from the word of God, don't listen to them. All right. So those are two tests that Moses gave the people that we can still apply to us today for whether or not we should believe the words that come from a man's mouth or a woman's mouth. This is one of the reasons I believe that the Bible is God's word because the Bible, what it says, its words, they reflect reality. They always have, they always will. There's not a thing happening in our culture today that is not proving the Bible right. The Bible teaches us when you turn away from God, this is what's going to happen. Guess what's happening? Right now, we're watching it happen right in front of our eyes. Trust the scriptures. Okay. You can trust the science as long as it's backed up in the scriptures. But trust the scriptures. All right. I'm going to show you a couple video clips just so you get a sense of what these prophets look like and what their shock value is. All right. The first one's a slightly humorous. This happened back in 2019. There's a, a group that is kind of like Greenpeace. Everyone knows who Greenpeace is because they've been around for a long time. But there's a group in the UK called Extinction Rebellion who have been causing a lot of havoc in London, England, um, blocking traffic and so on. And on one occasion, they brought a fire truck down to uh, the treasury in London, and they decided they were going to spray. And on the side, they had a banner that said, stop funding COVID death, All right? So we're going to notice a lot of the words they use are prophet words, right? You're all going to die, right? Doom and gloom and so on. And uh, they, they decided to spray, they are going to spray this treasury with fake blood, all right, from the fire truck. I want you to, uh, I want you to have a look at what happens here. It's a bit of a metaphor, uh, but you get the idea. All right. You get the idea. But there are multiple, <laughs> there are multiple videos of uh, what they were doing to stir up trouble. And this, this lady is, uh, Sarah Lunnan, is one of the leaders of Extinction Rebellion, who as a result of all the antics, they, they shut down all the bridges across the Thames River at one point. They had guys stand on top of the, uh, the trains, the tube, do they call it, in London, the subway trains. People were trying to get to work early in the morning, and the, these guys were standing on the tops of the trains. So people couldn't get to work, and they're disrupting everything, making a lot of people very angry. And of course, what that did was get them a lot of press. Well, I just want to play a, a little bit of this conversation. So in this conversation, there's an interviewer. Uh, with BBC, there is a climate scientist, okay? I want you to take some note as to what he has to say. And then there's an activist, Sarah Lunnan. And uh, I want you to note the, the messaging that's going on with all three of them and how they're interacting with each other. I'm not going to play the whole thing. We're going to jump in if I can make with this me. happen here. Sarah. Extinction Rebellion activists uh, to organize the most recent demonstrations and yep. Miles Allen. Air, but it calculates it to that level, is that? There, there are a number of scientists who have said, if we get to four degrees, which is Here where we we're heading at the moment, four degrees of warming, they cannot see how the earth can support no, no, but yeah. not one billion people, half a billion people. That's six and a half billion people dying. Sorry, so you're gonna stand by scientifically a projection that says within this century, we'll have the slaughter, death and starvation of six billion people. It's just good for us to know. No, because uh, what we can do as scientists is tell you about the risks we face. Um, the risks, the easy risks to predict, to be honest, are the ones that I do, how the climate system responds to rising greenhouse gases. 
The harder risks to predict are how people are going to respond yes. to losing the weather they knew as as their kids. But, 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 as, and, but I suppose and the reason I ask... And so I imagine what they're talking about there is the risks of the human response to climate change as much as the risk of climate change itself. But, when but, people but, ask but, me, but I suppose the point is, if there's no science that says that, do you understand why some people who are sympathetic to your cause also feel like you have fear-mongered? So, For instance, Roger Hallam has also said, our kids will be dead in 10 to 15 years. So, Emma, I don't know if you heard what Miles said there. He said, we are losing the weather we know. All of our agriculture and our food is based on weather that has been around for the last 10,000 years. If we don't have predictable weather, we don't have predictable food sources. We run the risk of multiple losses of harvest in the world's global bread basket. It's just to the extent That's that no you are food. it's just to the extent that you are projecting what you don't know onto the reaction of humans and that can be counted as fear-mongering. Roger Hallam did say our kids, we just double-checked this before we came on, would be dead within 10 to 15 years. There's a distinct possibility that we lose not only our food supplies, but our energy supplies. In California at let's the moment, let's, millions Miles of people the bit do not have let's electricity. Let's hear from a scientist as well. There's, there's a lot of possibilities in the future. And I think what was frustrating about this process is if we fixate on things we don't know, we're not even focusing on the things we do know which is there are perfectly achievable solutions to this problem. I was, in a, I was in a fossil fuel company last week, talking to them about 1.5 degrees, and I was asked the question, is there really any way of us solving, the, of us getting to net zero emissions by 2050? And I asked them, well, if you had to make the product you sell carbon neutral by 2050, would you be able to do so? And they just looked at each other and said, yes, of course we would. So is that, so is that the something... the solutions are out there. That, but that's really interesting. Is that going to be one of your focuses? Because what we were just hearing in the film there is that there has been some of the people that you work alongside, you protest alongside, have talked about overthrowing capitalism. And yet here a solution might be working with some of the architects of it, the oil companies. So um, Miles is talking about how we could move to net zero by 2050. Moving to net zero by 2050 gives us a 50-50 chance of staying at 1.5 degrees or below. That's not a risk that I want to take. So 1.5 degrees, we might stay within a stable climate. If we go over that, all bets are off, really. We don't know how hot it's going to get. I Miles. do not want to take a 50-50 chance on the future of everybody that I cherish. Well, Sarah, yeah, Sarah's just dumped all over that yeah, quickly. Let me, let me come back to the 1.5 report. Um, the risks go up with every half a degree of warming. Nobody's going to say, you know, oh, yes, we'll settle for an extra half a degree and it won't matter. Um, at no point did we say that if we cross one and a half degrees, um, we will, the, the warming will immediately accelerate out of control. So what we're looking at is how do we manage to stabilize this, this phenomenon that's going on? And I think the key point is those saying we have to overturn capitalism in order to do it, my main concern is I, I don't know if we've got time to overturn capitalism first and solve climate change later. I'd rather enlist some of the forces we've got available to us today to solve the problem now. I, I think you and Sarah are going to have a lot to talk about offset because we have run out of time, but no, there you go. I'm waited. sorry. We've Thank waited. we waited for 30 years Thank for capitalism to work and it hasn't worked. And Emma, you go when you go home, you will look at your children and you think I've got a 50-50 chance of it staying within a world that we know as it is today. Okay. And the people looking at Thank home... Thank you very much. You this, is not, well. this, is, this is where we have to leave it. Thank you very much for your time. You get the idea. <clears throat> Did you notice you have a scientist in the middle who's ba basically saying, yeah, there might be some concerns, but it's doable. We can do things about this. And he actually said in the middle of that, if you caught it, he, he talked about weather patterns might change and people may need to get used to weather that they didn't have when they were children. Okay. I don't know what that means. More snow? Okay, I can live with that, right? But you see the difference between that and the intensity of the activists who are saying, you know, doom and gloom, it's all over, capitalism hasn't worked, we have to overturn capitalism, and so on. We have to get rid of all fossil fuels, and, and it's a very different thing. So we have prophets, and uh, first of all, their message is dramatic. I think we 
see that and we hear it in banners like stop funding climate death or another one of theirs, business as usual equals death. These are the kinds of things that preachers would preach in open air, right? Turn or burn kind of thing. But now it's in a secular context. There's an influential climate leader, Bill McKibben, who published a book in 2019 called Falter. In it, he claimed that climate change is the greatest challenge humans have ever faced. The greatest challenge that humans have ever faced. Meanwhile, in real life, in the real world. Let's think of the death toll and damage of extreme events, like the Black Death that killed 50 million people. Has climate change killed that many? European wars and the Holocaust. Communists killed almost 100, communism, pardon me, killed almost 100 million through famines and economic hardship and political executions and so on. We have 9-11 and terrorism today, and yet Bill McKibben is saying that the greatest challenge humans have ever faced in all of history is what we're facing right now. And that doesn't even include uh, poor nations that are starving currently. And we're not thinking about those. Greta Thunberg, of course, we're going to be uh, quoting her a little bit tonight. I'll introduce you to her a little bit later, a little bit of her story, but uh, to the world leaders in 2019, her famous, how dare you speech, you've probably heard. People are suffering, she said. People are dying. Entire ecosystems are collapsing. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction. How much of that do you think is actually backed up by the science? They actually say that the IPCC, which is the United Nations branch for climate change, um, a lot of the scientists, they're actually writing the fine print, the small print science reports. A lot of what they're saying is somewhat reasonable and balanced, but it's the activists that come out. And of course, it's just the media takes a certain chapter or a certain section and they embellish that to be the end of the world is coming in the next week. Um, that's how it happens, and it has been to some degree hijacked. But these are the kinds of alarmism uh, messaging that is causing people, uh, well, some people, it's actually having a double effect. Some are becoming more and more frantic and irrational in their fear. Others are actually turning away from the movement as a result. And I may introduce you to one or two of those. In fact, one of the leaders of Greenpeace left the movement a number of years ago and turned on them and said, you guys have lost your way. Um, okay, uh, it has cultish characteristics. I won't spend too much time on this, but again, it has this, the same characteristics of a cult. There's never an admission of wrong for false predictions. I'm gonna look at a few of those tonight. And by the way, there's, there's a lot to choose from. I had to pick and choose for tonight which false predictions to, to select. Um, truth lies with them, right? The whole trust the science messaging. Uh, that, again, that's a characteristic of a cult. Followers are, are held to impossible expectations. You hear that zero, what was it? Zero emissions? How on earth are you going to get to that and still have a campfire? It, it, they're, they're expectations that are completely impossible. Followers are condemned for leaving. By the way, all of this includes you can't hunt for your food, so no meat eating, by the way, because you're hurting the environment by doing that. Irrational fear of the outside world. Intolerance towards critical scrutiny. They can't handle criticism. You saw a little bit of that in that clip. By the way, the, the reason the interviewer, BBC, which would be more of a liberal network, is so upset annoyed is because this group had caused such a disruption to the city over time. Uh, another thing, let's see here, based on scientific consensus, here we go, false prophecy of environmentalism is also based on scientific consensus. Well, what does that mean? There is no such consensus, by the way. There are a lot of scientists that disagree with the mainstream. Uh, consensus, by the way, is not how science works. It's not by a show of hands. They don't take a vote to decide whether gravity is gravity or not. 
right? It's based on whether or not you can prove that it's true. It doesn't matter how many people believe that it's true. Can you prove it? That's not how science works. Science often works through scientific challenges. When one scientist comes along against the group and says, well, I just did this experiment and it just proves what the rest of you think. And scientists actually come around and say, that's interesting, we're going to look into that. We're going to notice a little while later how this didn't work out. Uh, let's see, correlation of rising CO2 and global warming. Okay, here's another part of this idea of environmentalism or the messaging of environmentalism. There's a correlation. CO2 levels are rising. The globe is warming. Well, that doesn't mean the two are linked. Could be coincidence. We don't know. Correlation does not mean causation, and every scientist knows that. Warmer temperatures. Yes, they talk about warmer te temperatures. Let's stop and chat about this a little bit. Warmer compared to what? Okay, if we compare to 1870, yes, the globe is warming. That's a scientific fact. However, if we compare to the year 1000, which is a little harder to do, you say, how on earth do they do that? They didn't have thermometers back in the year 1000. How did they do that? 1000 AD. Um, so the, the way they would do that is there are some trees still, they're hard to find, but there are some trees that are over a thousand years old and they will cut them. Are you allowed to do that? They would cut them and uh, they would count the rings. And not only would they count the rings back, but they would, because every ring is another year of growth on that tree. And they would also measure the width of the ring. And that would decide how long the warm season was for that year. And if they go back and compare it to the year 1000, also known as the medieval warming period, the globe is actually cooler than it was then. 2005, NASA's Mars Global Surveil and Odyssey missions observed carbon dioxide ice caps near Mars' south pole getting smaller three years in a row. One of the head uh, space researchers at St. Petersburg, um, Polkovo, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, Ast Astronomical Observatory suggested this may be evidence global warming on Earth is not man-made at all, but is solar-made. In other words, it is affected by the sun. Because after all, who is on Mars to cause it? The only cause could be changes in the sun. And by the way, global warming, is that such a bad thing? Did you notice the scientists saying, we don't know how it's going to affect us? And we don't know how people are going to respond. Well, we do kind of know because historically we've seen how people have responded to weather changes. We've seen it over time. Challenges come up, especially in a free market society, people start to innovate and adapt and find ways to get through these challenges. They do. But there's no proof that this is actually a bad thing. Actual upsides that have been suggested, obviously, homes in the north like ours would save on heating bills, wouldn't we? Canadian farmers would produce more crops. Greenland would become more productive in fish and oil. There would be expanding forests. Canada and Russia would gain more production overall. This would actually be, could be an economically good thing. New study indicates as well, more people die from extreme cold each year than extreme heat. So there's a study that had been done, been done between 2000 and 2019, uh, which was a three-stage modeling study. And from extreme heat, by on average, and I hate talking about deaths as though numbers matter. These are people's lives. I get that. But listen to this. If you'll just... Excuse me for a few minutes here. Extreme heat, deaths under extreme heat, averaged about 500,000 per year worldwide. That's a big number. But extreme cold deaths worldwide averaged 4.5 million per year. Which do you think is worse? By the way, and again, back to the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel of, on Climate Change. They've been around for a long time. They released a new report this year, 2021, which has been spun into 
uh, you know, the apocalyptic narrative again. But in it, they talked about the increased temperatures over the past two decades has caused an extra 116,000 deaths, heat deaths per year, okay? So per year, 116,000 heat deaths. It fits the narrative. This is bad. The world warming is bad. However, however, if you consider the fact that cold waves have been reduced and as a result, the number of cold deaths has been reduced by 283,000. So we have an extra 116,000 heat deaths. We have less 283,000 cold deaths. So the net improvement, I can do pretty simple math, I think. The net improvement is that climate change has saved 166,000 lives each year. Michael Schellenberger was one of these guys who was once a climate activist and has come to realize that while he's still concerned about the environment, he's not a believer, but uh, I heard him just recently, he was being interviewed by Jordan Peterson and uh, uh, he was talking about the fact that he has come to realize the essential need for faith in his life. Now, I don't know what faith he's turned to, but it was a very interesting admission that he made through all of this because he was at one point kind of sinking into this doom and gloom, frantic, irrational fear, depression that was going on. Michael Schellenberger says that while the IPCC's science is broadly sound, its summary of policymakers, press releases, and author's statements betray ideological motivations, a tendency towards exaggeration, and an absence of important context. You don't see those unless you read the whole thing. And that's what the media takes. Okay, we have rising sea levels. Yes, this again is said to be a problem. Of course, in a little bit, I'm gonna show a little bit of hypocrisy around this one, but the small islands of the Maldives have been said that they were going to be doomed, they were gonna be overrun, and that the, what was it, 200,000 people that live on them would be out of their homes and would ultimately die and perish and so on. And that there would be increased erosion and the coast is going to uh, wear away and nothing's gonna be left. Uh, none of this has happened, by the way, we'll get to that in a little bit. There are other effects that uh, I wanna just mention that you'll hear at times, the ocean acidification, uh, decrease in glaciers, snow cover, permafrost, increasing storms and resulting deaths. Yet, uh, by the way, in the 1920s, there were 500,000 deaths related to storms. In the 2010s, there were about 18,000 deaths. 2020, and that I think is average per year, if I'm not mistaken. In 2020, there were 14,000 deaths due to storms like hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, and so on. Uh, 2021, it's project projected that there will be 6,000 deaths this year. It doesn't fit the narrative. Polar bears are going to die. You'll hear that one too. In fact, that was what got Greta Thunberg started in the first place. She was watching videos from National Geographic of polar bears, you know, walking very slowly and depressed and sad. And they're all dying. And yet the numbers actually have been increasing over the years. We'll get into that possibly a little bit later. Uh, increased forest fires. Yes, you'll hear this. I, I don't know if she said it in that video, I can't remember, about California is out of electricity or, or it's on fire. You hear this a lot. Um, increased forest fires, the amount of burnt forests has actually decreased in the past century. However, let's say it's all true. Let's say it's all true. Does it disprove scripture? No, it actually proves scripture to be accurate. If it was all true, then what Jesus said in Matthew 24 about famines and earthquakes in various places, all these are but the beginning of the birth pains of the end of the world. If it's all true, it's actually a hopeful thing for us and we need to be able to share that hope with the world. We'll get to that again in a little bit. But you can see that this is quite the message that they're giving, right? And they have a narrative and everything has to fit into that narrative. Everything doesn't necessarily fit into the narrative and we're gonna try and just kind of dismantle it a little bit at a time. But again, let's look at the gospel of these false prophets. What is the good news? What is the solution that they give? Um, 
among other things, there's, there's many, but some of them you need to be aware of. Again, they're gonna try and make you drive uh, zero emissions vehicles, electric cars. Uh, but it's interesting that they ignore what it takes to build these batteries in China, the fossil fuels that have to be burned in order to make the materials that build these and the mining that has to happen to get the minerals for these batteries to be built. The mining that takes place is not exactly eco-friendly. It's not exactly green. Or every time you go to charge your battery, and if you have a Tesla, by the way, I'm, I'm very happy for you, wonderful. Um, my boys, for some reason, are fascinated by Teslas every time they see one. That's a wonderful thing. It is pretty cool. I mean, you're driving around in a computer. It's pretty cool, pretty neat. And it is wonderful if, if this is, you know, the way things go in the future. I wouldn't say they're overly reliable. Um, whatever the case, every time you charge your battery, where do you think that power comes from? <laughs> It comes from somewhere. Someone's burning something to produce that power. It's not all coming from windmills, folks. It's most likely coming from fossil fuels. So this idea that you're not burning fossil fuels to drive your car is a lie. Oh, ethanol. I grew up in Chatham. I remember when the ethanol plant was built in Chatham and how wonderful it was said to be. I was in public school when they were selling this whole thing. And I remember the smell. There's a smell from the ethanol plant. It smells a lot like Hiram Walker. Um, that would just waft over the whole city at times, depending on which way the wind was blowing. Um, it's very expensive to make. It takes a lot of power. Again, a lot of power to keep that plant running. I used to work with an electrician who ended up quitting in the place that we were working and went to work at the ethanol plant. Well, how do they run electricity? Where do they get that electricity from? to make the ethanol. And then of course it's super expensive and it's not overly efficient. There's great expense that's put into this fuel for what? And not only that, but now there's a lot of corn that no one else can eat and the cattle can't eat and so on. So we're taking a lot of product, a lot of food and we're burning it away and seeking to make something to drive our cars. Again, I'm not sure it's a solution. Stop production of reliable energy sources, yes. I think the, the biggest one is nuclear power, which is safe, it's reliable, it's efficient, and it's cheap. Of course, none of that comes into play when it's talked about, it's looked at as an atomic bomb just down the road that's about to blow up and so on. People remember Chernobyl and what happened there, and that's, and again, our history's not correct, but it is probably the most reliable and safe, safest uh, resource of power on earth that we know of right now. These windmills are not efficient. They're just smothered in government subsidies to keep them running and to keep them profitable. Not to mention how annoying they are to the neighbors, right? And people around them. Um, I remember talking to a, a cousin of mine who works in the power industry, who was telling me about solar panels um, and how they're all, basically solar panels are all in series. And if a bird happens to poop on one of the solar plant panels, it reduces the efficiency of these things because it, now it's got a big spot on the panel somewhere and the electricity can't flow and so on. And it reduces the efficiency of these things down to like 2%. Not to mention the fields upon fields that these things have to take up um, to, to make them work and so on. They're not reliable, they're not affordable, they're not profitable, and they're not exactly environmentally safe and friendly. How many birds have been killed by windmills, right? Again, windmills are windmills, whatever. I'm thankful for technology and at least you tried, but again, they're, they're, the solutions don't seem to be better than the problem that they're diagnosing. Oh yes, this is a new one, folks. Where do you think all these lockdowns were headed? November 2021, just this month, New Delhi, New Delhi, sorry, India was under a partial lockdown because of a health emergency, not COVID. 
air pollution. You can't go out of your house because we don't want you breathing the air. You must stay home. Trust us. Safety first. We want you safe. All they have to do now, all the government that we talked about last week, the all-knowing, all-wise, all-seeing government has to do now is just declare an environmental emergency. And you and I are no longer to gather as the church. We're no longer to gather for Thanksgiving and Christmas. We're no longer to leave our homes. They can lock us down. There I said it. Hopefully it never happens. But it already has happened. And that, I fear, is probably not the end of environmental lockdowns. Well, there's probably more solutions, but I've picked a few just to kind of point, poke holes in them, and say that they're not exactly trustworthy solutions. Uh, we're going to get into identifying these false prophets for a moment. Just who are they? Of course, we have the activist, Greenpeace, Extinction Rebellion, Sarah Lunnan, we just saw, and so on. But we also have, of course, children. There's a group in the United States called the Sunrise Movement. You can look them up. A group of American youth that range in all ages. They actually stormed, shall we say, stormed, uh, Dianne Feinstein's office to force her to sign the Green New Deal, uh, I think it was last year, which Dianne Feinstein, who is no conservative fiscally, admitted we can't pay for. But they stood in her office and to watch these little kids basically calling her out and saying all sorts of things to her and trying to teach her a lesson and so on, Dianne Feinstein is not young, She's older, she's elderly, she would be their elder. Of course, Scripture clearly instructs young people to honor their elders and to watch these kids speaking in that way and scolding an elder to them, as much as I may disagree with her politically and morally and everything else, to watch young people scolding an older person is just backwards according to what culture should be according to scripture. Paul told Timothy not to rebuke an older man, but to encourage him as you would a father. Greta Thunberg, I can't help but speak about her, Thunberg, Thunberg. I've heard many ways of pronouncing it, but um, she was 11 years old watching uh, polar bear videos and videos about plastic waste and climate change, and she became so depressed she stopped talking and she stopped eating at 11 years old. Her parents, I think one of them is an opera singer or something. They're both performers. And the other, her mom was an actress, and eventually she told her mom she needed to stop flying. Well, that meant her mom had to give up her career as an actress, which she did. She chose to give it up. I will say this, Greta Thunberg is not a hypocrite. She, believes, she really believes this gloomy message that she preaches. She doesn't fly. She doesn't have a private jet. She actually, if she comes to North America, she sails across the Atlantic to get here. So I'll give her some kind of respect for that. She actually believes what she says. However, listen to her. Again, in 2019, she said around the year 2030 in 10 years, 250 days and 10 hours. We will be in a position where we set off an irreversible chain reaction beyond human control that will most likely lead to the end of our civilization as we know it. Listen to these words. I don't want you to be hopeful. I want you to panic. <laughs> and that's exactly the life she's lived. She's definitely not a hypocrite. She has lived a life of panic. She's not a happy girl. To watch her, you feel sorry for her. And I, I would say today as a Christian, she needs Christ. She needs to find the Savior and she needs to see the good news of Jesus Christ and the future that he has for her if she would only repent and come to him. But she hasn't. And as of right now, that's where she sits. And uh, to listen to her, she is one of the greatest mouthpieces. I think recently she was just at the climate change conference in Glasgow talking about how all the politicians are just going to be 
speaking blah, blah, blah. I think that was her famous line um, recently. She has no respect for politicians, even the ones who claim to be all about climate change because she sees their hypocrisy and so on. But again, the children. Uh, so we have activists, children, celebrities. Yeah, that's an obvious, right? Leonardo DiCaprio, Sheryl, Sheryl Crow. Uh, you name them, have, they're going around the country, talking, preaching the gospel of environmentalism and climate change. Politicians. Of course, Al Gore is one of the most famous, made the movie The Inconvenient Truth back in the early 2000s. In 2008, listen to this, Gore predicted that the North Polar ice cap would be completely ice-free in five years. Let's see, 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Yet the square kilometer, I don't know how to say that, square kilometerage, whatever, coverage of ice has actually increased rather than dis decreased to, I think it was the last I saw data, it was like 2018, 2019, something like that. Al Gore. Of course, we can't talk about this without talking about Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, right? Otherwise known as AOC. Again, her firm belief that the world is ending led to this statement. AOC's response to critics of the Green New Deal that she introduced, that is recklessly spending into oblivion, money nobody has. Her response was, The world is going to end in 12 years if we don't address climate change. And your biggest issue is how we're going to pay for it? In other words, the world's going to end, people. Sell your house, sell your car, go live in a box. I don't care what you do. But the world is ending, so your life doesn't matter. It's over. It's completely meaningless. Do you see the worldview here? Origin. Well, origin is no God. Meaning. With no God, there's really, the only purpose is nature, and nature's going to end, so there's really no purpose. So let's just spend all the money we have as a government, right? Morality, save the earth. Well, we can't do that, so we'll just steal people's money to try, right? You see the worldview, how it works? Of course, we have Justin Trudeau, who just hired a Greenpeace activist as his, uh, what is it, Ministry of Environmental... Ministry of the Environment. This guy, uh, at one point, he was so brazen, he went to the premier's house in Alberta. Not, not Jason Kenney, the, uh, Klein, Ralph Klein, was it? With a group of people, climbed up on his roof and installed a solar panel on the premier's roof while his terrified wife sat inside and didn't know what was going on with these guys in orange jumpsuits outside. He is now our minister of the environment. You don't think climate lockdowns are coming? Of course, you have Boris Johnson, the UK PM prime minister again, claiming it's one minute to midnight. Well, it's a little closer than a hundred seconds. I don't know. We've lost a bit of time there. Prince Charles again, another one notorious. Literally our last chance saloon, he called it. The media of course, one-sided narrative there, pick and choose. Of course, it sells the news, right? End of the world stories sell news. People watch that kind of stuff. Why do you think they're always dealing in catastrophes and tragedies and everything else? Uh, religious leaders. Yeah, the Catholic Pope said just recently, time is running out. This occasion must not be wasted. This is what he just said before the climate change conference in Glasgow. Was it earlier this month or in October? Uh, this occasion must not be wasted lest we have to face God's judgment for our failure to be faithful stewards of the world he has entrusted to our care. Okay, a lot of what he said is true about stewardship. We're going to get to that in a little bit. Um, and it is true that human beings can abuse the creation, absolutely. Absolutely but he has bought right into this climate change narrative and the world ending and so on. Time is running out, he said. And of course, evangelicalism. Yes, Christianity Today has articles about climate change. There's a 
I think it's a British operation called Operation Noah. It's an evangelical organization preaching the gospel of faith-motivated, science-informed, hope-inspired environmentalism. Operation Noah. I think there was like a big natural disaster that happened in Noah's time. And he lived through it. He survived that. And I think God, after that, promised him that to the end of the world, there would always be the four seasons. Isn't that true? So I really find it hard to take when I see evangelical groups blatantly going against Scripture this way. This is probably, this is, not probably, this is the most devastating of all of them the most frustrating, the most wicked. Greta Thunberg, misinformed, 11-year-old, has been propagandized her entire life. I get that. And I actually sympathize. I feel pity towards her. I do. But these people? No, you're false prophets. Like blatantly false prophets. And to use Noah as your example, that's extreme. Catherine Hayhoe is another one. I think she's American, professing Christian and a climate scientist who believes in climate change and so on. Uh, and if you Christmas is coming, folks, so you might want to get this for your relatives, but there is there has been published the Green Bible, the Green Bible. The purpose of producing it, the belief that the Bible encourages environmentalism, so of course your all your footnotes and the text are all going to be about how you should use less plastic and conserve on paper and so on. I don't know. I don't have it, but I know it exists. So you're all probably looking it up. You get that. You figure out what that is. It's another example of reading into scriptures what you want to pull back out again. Folks, the Bible isn't about environmentalism. It's about God making the world and through all of world history, revealing himself to his creation. Creation revealing his glory, even in a world that's broken. Yes, in a world that's broken, he purposed to reveal his glory through the cross of Jesus Christ. The Bible is about God. It's not about the environment. We need to spell this stuff out. We need to be able to look at these things and say, something's off about that. I'm not sure what it is. I think I should probably talk to somebody. It's a good conversation piece for the dinner table. For the family, right? Sitting around. Hey, guys, what do you think about this? I saw this thing about the Green Bible today. What do you think? Get a good conversation going about what the Bible is and what it's supposed to be for and what its basic message is. Environmentalism has a long history of failed prophecies. This